We have seen that there are predictive approaches to directly capitalize on the correlations in the spatial domain. And we will also talk about transformations which decorrelate the data first and then encode the important coefficients. In this segment, we cover fractal encoding, which is yet another way to capture the self-similarities in an image. It's actually a mathematically intriguing concept. We capture the self-similarities through contractive or non-expansive operators. Then all we have to send to the decoder are these transformations capturing this self-similarity. Decoding consists of an iterative reconstruction algorithm, which is not the most desirable form of decoding. We will also compare fractal encoding to vector quantization. We'll see that with fractal encoding, a virtual codebook is used, which is not needed to be sent to the decoder. So let's proceed again with this exciting topic. We will discuss in this segment the basic ideas behind fractal image compression. They present indeed intriguing ideas, considerably different from predictive encoding that we already covered and transfer-based encoding and subband that we will cover next. They're related to the fractal computer graphic algorithms. However, when we talk about computer graphics, we have this abstract image in our head that we try to create through graphics algorithms, while when we talk about compression, we have the actual data, the actual images based on which we want to pull out the transformations, as we'll see, that describe this fractal compression. The basic idea is that there are self-similarities inside the image that, if exploited appropriately, and these similarities will be expressed through transformations, as you will see, these transformations will represent the encoded image. Fractal image compression relates to vector quantization, but unlike V2, where a codebook needs to be transmitted to the decoder, with fractal encoding, this codebook is a virtual one. This is the advantage, you might say, of fractal over VQ, However, the disadvantage is that with fractal decoding, an iterative algorithm needs to be implemented, while for VQ, it's just a lookup table. And iterative algorithms, by and large, are computationally expensive. So let us look now at the specific details of fractal encoding. We see here the encoder and decoder of a fractal codec, coder-encoder structure. X is the image we want to encode. The objective during encoding is to uncover this transformation T that has X as its fixed point. And X is the whole image or is typically a patch of the image. So if this patch is processed by T, it's going to give us back the same patch. So if this transformation is contractive, it means that it has a unique fixed point and this fixed point is the image. So the transformation, actually transformations applied to each patch of the image uncover this self-similarity, and it is these transformations that represent the encoding of the image and they're sent over to the decoder. The decoder, after receiving this transformation, performs this iterative reconstruction. It starts from an arbitrary initial condition and then generates the first estimate of the image as t applied to x0. The second estimate, at the second iteration, that is, is t applied to x1, which is t applied to t x0, so it's t squared x0. So again, this being a contractive operator in the limit after infinitely many iterations, a large number of iterations, it's going to converge to the original image that we had encoded. So it's really an intriguing idea that the image can be represented by these transformations that, again, capture the self-similarity in the image, and this transformation being contractive allow then for the iterative reconstruction of the image at the decoder. So it's a different concept, again, than predictive or transform-based compression. At, at some point, it was thought that this would be the 
um, approach that will replace all other compression approaches. Uh, it's been very successful. It has not led, however, to any specific uh, image compression standards. So, as already mentioned, fractal encoding or fractal mapping is based on the assumption that the redundancy in the image can be efficiently exploited through these self-transformations. These trans self-transformations are performed, by the way, on a block-wide basis, and then this gives rise to this iterative reconstruction of the image. So, given an image, we will look at each and every block in this image, block D of I, the domain block, and then out of a set of possible transformations, we'll find the most appropriate T of I transformation for this particular block D of I that will make D of I as close as possible, as similar as possible to another block R of I. So we see that this transformation, which is going to be a concatenation of transformations, will also shift D of I to another location where R of I is, and is also going to subsample, decimate D of I to obtain R of I. So the general idea is given a block D of I, we are allowed to apply four different types of transformations and finding the most appropriate one from these four classes we are going to result in an R of I as close as possible to D of I. And the concatenation of these four classes of operators will give rise to T of I, the overall transformation applied to D of I. Now these transformations, X of I is a contractive operator, and we'll see examples of such contra contractive operators. I of I is an isometry operator, D of I is the decimation operator I just mentioned, and P of I is the put operator that will perform the shifting of D of I to the location of R of I. So we'll see examples of contractive operators. We'll have a, a set of them to select from. Isometry, these are non-expansive operators. We'll see examples of those. And again, the idea is out of a set of X of I's and I of I's, pick the most appropriate ones, and then find, find P of I, assuming we have fixed D of I here, that will allow us to find an R of I, which is as similar as possible to D of I. So this is the whole idea, and therefore the image is just encoded through these T of I operators on per block basis. Let us look at some examples of contractive operators. Before we do so, actually, let's define a contractive operator. So T is contractive if Tx1 minus Tx2, the distance or the norm, is less equal than alpha, the distance between x1 and x2, where alpha is strictly less than 1. So what this tells us is that if we have two points, x1 and x2, two images, two patches, and these are transformed by the same operator T, so this is Tx1 and this is Tx2, the distance now of the transformed images has contracted. So Tx1 minus Tx2, so this distance here is smaller than the distance of the original points. So with this definition, it's straightforward to confirm that the examples I'll describe here indeed represent contractive operators. So the first example is the absorption at a certain gray level. So given a pixel xij is set equal to c, a specific gray level. It's absorbed by this gray level. Similarly, the luminance shift is if the pixel intensity xij is shifted by c. Contrast scaling, so xij is multiplied by c. And color reversal, we encountered this when we talked about enhancement. It's input-output relationship of such a transformation is described by a curve like this. So if you recall, it's the negative of, of an image where black becomes white and white becomes black. So we have a set of such transformations to select from, 
and these are combined with the other the isometries and the shifting and the down sampling and selecting the appropriate ones we try to map a domain block d of i into a range block r of i so that the difference is as small as possible now instead of trying all possible available transformations for each and every block we can classify the blocks into for example three classes here shade blocks mid-range and edge blocks and then for each class only make available the most appropriate operators out of all possible operators let us look at examples of isometries now uh, first of all a, a mapping t is an isometry when the distance between tx1 and tx2 is less equal than the distance between x1 minus x2 so the distance could decrease after the mapping however it could remain the same we're not guaranteed to contract it by a certain factor alpha as in the case of contractive mappings i should mention here that both the contractive and isometry properties depend on the specific norm we are using so what are some examples of isometries the first one is the identity t is identity it's doing absolutely nothing on the specific patches reflection about the mid vertical axis so given a patch like this here is the mid, mid vertical axis and therefore this pixel switches places with this one this pixel switches places with this one reflection about the mid horizontal axis it's easy to see reflection about the first diagonal so if this is the patch or the block here is the first diagonal and therefore this pixel switches places with this one this switches places with this one this remains the same this remains the same reflection about the second diagonal in a similar manner rotation around center of block through 90 degrees so here is the block again and here is the center so here is 90 degrees so we rotate the whole block by 90 degrees rotation around center through 180 and through minus 90 since the rotations here are integer multiples of 90 we do not need to perform any interpolation I just uh, keep the same pixels as before they simply change location so here are the available an, an example of available isometries and again the idea is to combine isometries with contractive mappings out of the list we have available and find the appropriate one so d of i will be mapped to an r of i with the smallest possible error let us now look at similarities and differences between vq and fractal encoding that we have already alluded to with vq a specific codebook is utilized while with fractal encoding this codebook is virtual in designing the codebook in vq we need to use a set of training images while under fractal encoding it's just the original image you are encoding that is utilized and as already mentioned with vq the codebook needs to be transmitted the decoder needs to have the identical codebook in order to be able to decode the image while under fractal encoding this is not necessary so based on this consideration fractal encoding has an advantage you might say over vq however when it comes to decoding decoding under vq is quite straightforward you just use a lookup table however under fractal decoding an iterative algorithm needs to be utilized and such algorithms are computationally demanding and by and large uh, a convergence criterion needs to be satisfied before it is terminated as far as the codebook itself goes under vq we send the list of addresses or indices as we explained that tells us which particular code vector was utilized for a particular block while under fractal encoding we send this list of transformations that were applied to each 
domain block. I should mention here that the concatenation of a contractive and non-expansive mapping results in a contractive mapping, which is what we are after there to guarantee that there is a unique fixed point when we do the iterative reconstruction. We show here an example of fractal encoding using VCDemo again. Actually, the program uh, gives you choice of the mean and max sizes of the range blocks and then also a choice of the threshold based on which the range block is split into additional blocks. Then a fixed number of bits is used for the shift. Three bits are used for the isometries. And as far as the contractive mappings go, the number of bits can be selected, but only a scale and offset are utilized as contractive mappings. And finally, the number of iterations can be set. So you have quite a few choices here, and you are encouraged again to use the software package and see these results uh, on your own. So the result after the first iteration is shown here. We also see the peak SNR, 17.8 dB. What you observe here is that the flat regions are reconstructed first and the edge information is the one that will appear at later iterations. After two iterations, here is how the decoded image looks like. So you start seeing some of the edge information also come alive and the peak SNR increases. After three iterations, this is the decoded image. And after four iterations, we see a rather high peak signal to noise ratio, almost 30 dB, and the image looks very similar to the original one. We do not show here the original one, but you've seen it multiple times already. It is indeed quite intriguing to think about the fact that we started with a random image, or maybe a constant black image or constant white image. It does not really matter what is the initial estimate of the decoded image, it's simply that all the information about the original image is encoded into these transformations, and again, since these transformations, the concatenation of them forms a contractive mapping with a unique fixed point, and this fixed point is the original image, then we are guaranteed to a suitable reconstruction. Of course, the quality of the reconstruction is a function of the parameters I already mentioned, um, and, of course, of the number of bits that we are allowed to allocate to the various transformations.